What does it mean to be called crazy in a crazy world? Listen to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health. Tuesdays, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLP FM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD Kasilov and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project, streaming, podcasting, and archive at madnessradio.net. Thanks for tuning in to Madness Radio. This is your host, Will Hall. Today we have um, Paula Kaplan. Paula is a clinical and research psychologist uh, lecturing at Harvard University in the Women, Gender, and Sexuality Program. She's a fellow at the Du Bois Institute at Harvard, and she's the author of They Say You're Crazy and the editor of Bias in Psychiatric Diagnosis. Thanks a lot for joining us today on Madness Radio, Paula Kaplan. Glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, we. Um, I want to let people know that we did an interview with you about a year and a half ago that's available on the Madness Radio website, madnessradio.net, so people can check that out as well. And also your website, is, which is a fantastic um, resource about psychiatric diagnosis and the problems and, and limits and bias in psychiatry, is psychdiagnosis.net. So yeah, so it's great to have you back on the show. Glad to be back with you. So I guess what I wanted to start out with was just the... Um, something that people may know about if they've if they've listened to the show or they've been watching the news is that the um there was a statistic that came out recently that the increase in a diagnosis of bipolar disorder um has gone up by four thousand percent in the last ten years. And I'm wondering what you what you make of that because I think scientists and doctors will say, Oh well there's all these people with bipolar disorder out there and we just have been discovering them. Uh, right, right. Well, I mean, if you look at the history of psychiatric diagnosis, um, you see a number of things. One, one of the most um, glaring um, features of the history of psychiatric diagnosis is uh, the extent to which it clearly um, could not be farther from scientific. And when there is little or no science involved, then you get um, distortion and omission and even uh, purposeful misrepresentation sometimes of what the research really shows. And when, when, there's, when, there's, um, when the decisions about diagnosis are not based on science, it creates a vacuum. It leaves a vacuum. And what goes into a vacuum where there isn't science? Well, every conceivable kind of bias. So you get the history of psychiatry and, and of diagnosis is a history of uh, which, which diagnosis is the fad of the week or of the month or of the era. And the big ones these days um, the, are the um, bipolar uh, disorder and um, Asperger's syndrome, as far as I can tell. So, no, it's, it's, there's absolutely no reason to believe that there were all these people who had bipolar disorder uh, all along and we're just now discovering them. I think several things are going on. Um, but I should say first, when we talk about somebody having a disorder or having a psychiatric problem, um, it's really important to be aware that uh, we, keep needing, we need to keep putting quotation marks around the word have uh, because um, it, it's so far from being the case that we know what mental illness even is. Um, after all, the definition of mental illness, it depends on who's defining it. And it's not like mental illness or abnormality are out there to be discovered. It's, um, it's what psychologists call a construct, it, like love or intelligence. Um, it, it's defined by whoever is defining it, and people define it in somewhat different ways. So there's no hard and fast uh, way to define mental illness. And then by the same token, um, it's, it's difficult, if not impossible, to come up with hard and fast definitions of just about everything that's been called a psychiatric disorder. Now, I want to make it clear that that doesn't mean that there aren't people who are profoundly sad or who feel helpless or who feel terrified or, or who um, have a variety of other kinds of, um, of difficulties. Um, but it's like if you look up in the sky, you can say there's a star and there's a star and there's another star. And different people can come along and divide those stars up and say that group over there is one constellation, and somebody can create another constellation, but that doesn't mean that the stars are any different than they were, and it doesn't mean that certain ones clearly belong together and always go together. 
Um, so when we talk about someone having bipolar disorder, we kind of don't know what, what we're talking about very much except uh, mood swings. And supposedly these are, um, these are extreme mood swings, but who defines what's extreme? I know, I know women who um, are um, employed in paid work, say Monday through Friday, and when they go to their paid job, uh, they know that their work is being appreciated to some extent at least because they get a check at the end of the week. Um, but And sometimes somebody even says, oh, good work. That doesn't usually happen with being a mother. Um, and so on the weekends, all of a sudden, these women feel uh, their, work is, their work at home is unrecognized, unappreciated, taken for granted. And so what about somebody like that who feels pretty up during the week and pretty down on weekends? And that, that's not all that uncommon. Do we want to say that person has bipolar disorder? And, and do we want to say they do as well as someone who, um, for no discernible reason, really seems to experience um, extreme, excessive mood swings, mood swings that um, are excessive in the sense that they feel completely beyond their, the person's control. There, there doesn't seem to be any, um, any recognizable um, cause for them. And, and so we, we tend to lump a lot of things that have to do with changes in mood under the category bipolar disorder and then put everybody on medication. Yeah, one of the things that I've learned in the work that I've um, done at the Freedom Center and the Icarus Project is that when someone says, oh, I have bipolar disorder, or I've been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, I don't really know that much about what they're going through. I mean, I, right. I have to really ask right. them because two different people, three different people can have completely different experiences. They, one person's experience that gets labeled bipolar is totally different and completely um, distinct and individual from another person's. And then the other thing that I've noticed is that people will get different diagnoses during their lives. They'll have, they'll start out with a depression diagnosis, then they go to one doctor and they get a bipolar diagnosis, and then a different doctor says, oh, actually you have a schizophrenia diagnosis or a schizoaffective diagnosis, right. and then somebody else comes along and says, well, actually what you've got is PTSD, or, and then it just, so the, um, the scientific question um, is never really answered because the scientific criteria aren't there, like you're saying. So, yeah. so break it down for us, Paul, in terms of um, there's such a widespread belief in the media um, and among doctors in the profession that the, these are scientific facts that, well, bipolar disorder is, is genetic and it's a chemical imbalance and the, um, the way that your brain works, the chemistry of it is off and it's a biological um, fact. And, and, and so it's clearly a scientific phenomenon, but you're saying that that's not actually true. No, it isn't. And I have to tell you, my son is, um, is a neuroscientist and he teaches at the University of Alberta. And we wrote a book together called Thinking Critically about research on sex and gender. And we, we just did the, the uh, revision for the third edition. We have a whole new chapter in there on the brain. Now, I'm not an expert on the brain, but he is. And one of the things that, that he um, has taught me and that I've also learned by doing a lot of, a lot of reading in the field is that um, when uh, that that when people say, oh, uh, you know, depression is due to low serotonin. Well, it's sort of like you know the the fable about the uh, the blind people and the elephant, and each one is is just touching one part of the elephant and thinks they're 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 um, in touch with the whole thing. Um, what what happens is that um, people will choose to do research on some fragment, some aspect of the brain or the central nervous system or neurochemicals or, um, or um, electro, uh, electromagnetic uh, imaging and so on. And, they'll, and what, they'll, what they'll do is if they find that somebody who says they're feeling sad or says they have mood swings, if, um, if they're, whatever chemical you're looking at or whatever part of the brain you're looking at uh, seems to be somewhat different from the brain of someone who doesn't report themselves in that way, um, then they jump to the conclusion that we've found the cause. Now, there are two problems with that. One is what you may be looking at is an effect, not a cause, because it's well known that, yes, although the brain, brain changes in the brain, changes in hormones, changes in neurochemicals can affect moods and behavior, 
It can also go the other way around, that if you behave in a certain way or something happens to make you feel in a certain way, it's going to change your, your uh, neurochemistry and it can change the electrical activity in the brain. So one of the problems is we don't know whether we're looking at a cause or an effect. And the other, and the other problem is that when you hear claims like, oh, low serotonin causes, that, that's what causes depression, we've found the cause. Um, that may be, if it is causal, that may be only one of quite a number of causes. And it, it, I, don't, I can't think of another field in which people feel so free to mess around with what is quite likely, um, if, if, it is, if it is relevant, it's just one fragment of all the possible relevant factors and then say, oh, let's just do this and assume we fixed it. Now, we know that the record of um, psychopharmacologists in fixing people's emotional problems is, is really abysmal. This recent uh, mega, mega study that just came out showing that the so-called antidepressants, now these are not antidepressants it turns out, these are drugs marketed as antidepressants um, because when you report mild or moderate depression, it turns out they really don't help. Um, only for some people who have severe depression. And then if you watch the ads on TV, you see another trend coming up, which, which just reinforces um, my, my concern about uh, we're only looking at one fragment of the picture, um, if, if indeed neurochemicals are relevant at all. Um, and that is, uh, increasingly you see these commercials that, are, that have the message, um, are you depressed? Have you been taking a drug for the depression? Do you still not feel very well? Well, then get in touch with us because now there's increasingly a tendency toward polypharmacy. In other words, if one drug doesn't help, we'll add another one. And if that doesn't make it all better, then we'll keep adding more. And because I cannot... uh, supposedly you have a, more, a special refined form of the disorder and it requires multiple drugs to target it specifically. Yeah, right, right, right. Oh, I'm sorry, that's my cell phone. Um, anyway, yeah, that, that's, what they, well, that's what they say, but they don't have any more proof of that than, than of the fact that, that they're claiming that, ser that serotonin is what you needed in the first place. Isn't it also true that there's never been any consistent pattern um, established saying that all the people who have bipolar label have a consistent chemical difference from so-called normal people, that there's never been any kind of consistent, everybody who's depressed has low serotonin. In fact, like even what's considered normal neurochemistry hasn't even been established by, um, right. by medical science. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. And see, one of, the, one of the things that my son and I were writing about was that um, people, people think, and somebody just did a study of this. Um, in fact, I just, I just got to tell you this study because it's, it's just so, it's so powerful. Um, and, it's, and it's relevant to a lot of what we're talking about. Um, if you uh, write an article and you publish this article, or you, you have people read this article, and it's about some piece of, of psychological research, and if you have two versions of this article, and they are identical except that um, uh, in, in, one, in, the case, uh, in one case, um, there's no illustration with it. In the other case, there is some kind of picture of a brain imaging shot. If you have people read these two, um, they are more likely to believe that the, um, that the one that has a, a, an image of the brain in it uh, represents some discovery of the truth, even though it's the identical article. So um, there are so many problems with doing research on the brain and trying to draw conclusions from it. Um, it's hard enough trying to draw conclusions about the relationship of the brain to, say, performance on a math test. When we come to looking at not only emotions, but emotions that cause people pain and anguish, we're talking about something exceedingly complex. We're talking about something very nuanced. We're talking about something that's filled with subjectivity. Um, you know, if I get a score on a math test and it's lower than yours, we know what we're talking about here. What, what, what is the difference between what I did and what you did? But um, if you say um, you're, you're having problems with mood swings and I say so am I, 
how do we decide, well, is it the same kind of problem? Is it to the same extent? Is my experience the same as yours? Um, and um, so all of the same problems that go into trying to do research on everything else in psychology um, are, are just multiplied geometrically or increased geometrically uh, when we try to look at, um, at emotional problems and when we try to look at research on the brain and its connection with emotional kinds of problems, then we have further um, hurdles to, to, that we have to deal with. So, for example, um, all of these fancy pieces of equipment to study brain imaging in various ways, um, first of all, they're very expensive. Secondly, um, they're t it's time-consuming to run these studies, so time-consuming and costly. And so it's not as though we can do with, with brain imaging studies or neurochemistry even what we do um, with, with giving, let's give a thousand kids a math test. Um, we can't do that. It costs an absolute fortune. And so um, there have not been studies in which people who do not complain of emotional problems um, have their brains studied in every conceivable way with respect to neurochemistry and electrical activity and so on, um, and, and, uh, and then uh, compare those to um, the brains in every respect of people who have various kinds of emotional problems. So the, the research just isn't there. And yet, to hear a lot of our colleagues talk, um, that you know, they use the phrase, we know that such and such, and actually very, very little is known. So continuing on this question of, of how scientifically valid um, different diagnoses are, um, what about the whole genetic argument? Because um, people say, oh, well, bipolar disorder runs in my family, um, or um, there's a genetic causality here, or identical twin studies, or if you have, if one child has a bipolar disorder diagnosis, then then their child, the future generation, has a higher rate of bipolar disorder. Tell, tell us about that. Well, uh, oh, that would make that would just make a great um, gigantic textbook. Um, we could talk about that for hours. But um, first of all, let me say that um, because there's so much bias and subjectivity in the process of psychiatric diagnosis, if you sometimes feel happy and sometimes feel sad, and your father or mother was given a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, then chances are pretty high that you're going to think, oh, well, I guess I have bipolar disorder. And that if you go to see a therapist, and, you know, if they're taking a decent history, then one of the things they'll ask you is any emotional problems in your family. And you'll say, oh, yeah, my dad was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Well, so then what happens? They are much more likely... To, say, to, to describe your mood changes as constituting bipolar disorder, right? So, so you get a kind of, a kind of um, determination, you know, a predetermination of how your emotional states are going to be labeled based partly on what you say your history is. The twin studies, I really don't have time to go into, but, there, but there's... A, uh, there's a wonderful uh, chapter in the Bias in Psychiatric Diagnosis book by Jeffrey Poland about, about what gets called schizophrenia and about how everybody thinks that because there are these twin studies, I mean, those are supposed to be like the, the sterling um, examples of good research that proves there's a genetic factor. Um, they're just a mess methodologically. And so a lot of stuff that people even learn in graduate school is the truth. Um, uh, just there's just there's just not good science behind it. Is there research behind it? Sometimes, but there's all the difference in the world between research and good research, and there's not very much of the latter in in this very complex field of emotional problems. So you've been talking about it, it, people who have swings or they have strong feelings of sadness or strong feelings of of happiness. But what about those experiences that people have that are really just off the charts, like complete, they get labeled with psychosis. People are just in a completely different world, or they're just absolutely out of out of control. What would you say about that? I mean, it's just so uh, tempting to say, "Oh, well, obviously that's a physical problem. Their brain is malfunctioning. It's a disorder. It's a it's a disease that they have." Yeah. Well, um, you know, if I see somebody walking on, along the street and limping, then um, I I don't have the right to assume that 
I know why they're limping. Um, if, if I haven't got the laboratory tests or the x-rays or the skills with which to examine them and find out why they're limping, then I have no, no right, and it's, I think it's unethical and immoral for me to assume that I know what's at the bottom of that. Um, why should we think that extremes of anything must be biologically caused. I think there are reasons people want to believe that, but um, there there are many many examples of people who were diagnosed with the most extreme labels like schizophrenia and psychosis and so on, who are um, what they're experiencing is absolute terror, and this is how they cope with it. Now. Um, is there a biological basis for that? Well, someday we might find out that in some people there is. I mean, there seems to be a biological basis in some people for panic disorder. Um, I know people like this. I, I have there's a tendency um, that, that, seem, that I seem to have myself physiologically that once in a while I'll just, it's like somebody flipped a switch. And if I, if I didn't know that, oh, yeah, that's, um, that's a physiological thing, and if I just wait, it will go away, then it's very easy for people who have that kind of physical predisposition to, to start um, uh, drinking or using drugs or uh, doing compulsive hand-washing or whatever they think is going to lower that, that sense of extreme anxiety because they don't know, oh, if you just wait, it'll go away. So I, I would never say that we know that there are no physiological reasons for any kind of emotional experience, but um, it's, it's so easy and irresponsible to say if somebody's having an extreme experience then instead of thinking about what are the various kinds of, of possible causes, and since we, we uh, often really don't know what the causes are, even if they're, even if they're just environmental causes or, or, or interpersonal or emotional causes, uh, quite apart from the brain, what we need to be focusing on is looking at a whole range of possible ways to help. And this obsession that our culture has with focusing on diagnosis and focusing on the supposedly physiological and brain basis of, of emotional problems takes our attention away from figuring out how to help. Let me give you an example of this. A, a few years ago, I read an article very prominently displayed in the New York Times. Uh, NIH or NIMH had just funded a major study of what helps teenagers who are depressed. Now, of course, I read this because you know, sadness and profound sadness in teenagers is a very serious problem, and so, so I wanted to know what does help. Well, the, what, here's what the study was. The study was, to des was designed to answer the following question. Does medication help them? Does psychotherapy help them? Or does a combination of medication and psychotherapy help them? And the conclusion was, well, it's a combination of both. Now, something was bothering me about that article. And I realized what it was, and that is that I've seen lots of teenagers who would be described as depressed. I used to work at the family court clinic in Toronto for three years. I mean, that was a lot of what we saw. And um, I tell you, the things that have tended to be helpful to them have very often, in fact, most often, had nothing to do with either psychotherapy which most teenagers are not interested in, frankly. We, we'd get people court-ordered to come and talk to us at the family court clinic. They did not want to sit and talk to us, frankly. You know? So um, what, what's often much more helpful uh, is a whole range of other things, like having friends or learning how to make friends or, or taking an acting class or writing or drumming or meditating or going for a run or doing some volunteer work or having some kind of successful experience experiences in your life. And we have blinders on, I say we as a culture, because it's not just the mental health professionals, and, and of course not all mental health professionals think in these, these, these harmful ways. There are some very good ones. But, but as a whole culture, lay people, um, talk show hosts, uh, tend to act as though there are only two things to think of if somebody has an emotional problem, and that's drugs or psychotherapy. And each of those sometimes may be helpful to some people, but 
um, why are we not looking at this enormous range of other things? I think Makes it's because there's a, no yeah. money to be made <laughs> on a big scale from those other things. I do a lot of peer counseling and talk with people all the time who are um, you know, facing these kinds of decisions about what to do. And I'm, I'm just thinking of, of someone I spoke to um, a couple months ago who was complaining of very severe depression and um, this person's therapist was saying, well, you know, this is, this depression is pretty bad. It's not lifting. And maybe you should consider antidepressant, um, so-called antidepressant drugs. And so this person was, was talking to me and I wasn't really, I wasn't saying, no, don't, don't do the drugs. I was telling her like I always do. Well, it's important to look at all the options and get the information and just talking with her more and more. Um, she was very depressed about not having a job and she was procrastinating and she was very, very um, stuck about putting out some resumes. She had just had no she for somehow is was for some reason she was freezing about sending out resumes about her job so i talked with her and i said well look well, what about it sounds like you're having a hard time doing this on your own why don't you get some help from a friend of yours to get the resumes out there and and get rolling on getting a job because that it sounds to me like from listening to you is the thing that's really most um fueling your depression and and so she was able to get a friend to help her to get the resumes out and now she's in the job market and getting um close to having the job that she wants and she feels not as depressed and mm. you know if that was if that was um it's too bad that that approach isn't taken with with more people find out what their life problem is and help them work on their their life problem i know that i was diagnosed with schizophrenia and so when you talked about um, terror. I absolutely. That's that's really a lot of what I deal with on an ongoing basis. There's kind of like a well of terror that I can fall into, and at times of my life, I've just fallen very deep into that. And I, I know that it's very much related to trauma that I've been through. And and trauma is an experience that we have. It's not caused by biology, but it can have extreme physiological impacts on the person and and it's for me it wasn't just family experiences there was also surgeries that i had that were traumatic for me as a very young kid and a oh. lot of different things i think fed into building this kind of terror well that i call it and then sometimes i just fall into it and sometimes it's bigger than than other times sometimes i'm living um living in it but i i, I tried all the different uh, medications i tried the mainstream uh, approaches and then um, started to think in terms of trauma and started to think in terms of um, peer support and looking at things like nutrition and, and poverty and that kind of thing. And that's how I was able to kind of change things for myself. What I have seen over the years, I have to tell you, I turned 60 last summer. And, and so I've, you know, I've got a lot, of, a lot of years behind me now in thinking about this kind of stuff. And, and what, I, what I think is this, that just as, there has been very little protest against the, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, and I think it's I think it's largely because people know that Bush and his cronies, who have the power, really don't care what we think. That what we do is not going to make any difference anyway. I think people just feel so hopeless and helpless to change that. And I think in a similar way. If we look at the people who get called schizophrenic or psychotic, um, we will see that many, many, if not all of them, are going through um, situations that would be made better by a job, um, a, a safe place to live, um, enough money to live on, and friends. Um, well, you know what? American society is not set up reliably to provide those things for people. And we know that we just feel helpless in the face of this system that has created so many homeless people and doesn't have reasonably priced housing and doesn't help people get jobs, especially if they are quote-unquote weird or strange or, or not socialized to behave in exactly the way that we expect, you know, whatever, a receptionist or who, whatever it is to, to behave. And so we just feel powerless to change these systems. And, and so we do what we are taught to do, which is um, if we're therapists, we either provide or recommend uh, um, therapy or medication. And if we're friends or family, uh, we tell the person that that's what they need to get. And it's just, it's just easier than to look at the, the 
sweeping social problems. I mean, look how much violence there is in this society. Look at how much harassment. Look at how much sexism and racism and homophobia and classism and ageism and ableism there is. There, there. Um, if you, if I said to you, just in the abstract, um, there is someone who gets treated in um, not necessarily even physically violent ways, but who regularly gets treated in isolated and demeaning ways. And if I said to you, now, how do you think they would feel? Um, You would say, well, of course they would feel depressed. Of course they would feel um, scared. Of course they would feel isolated and alone. Um, Well, let's talk about those feelings and what to do about the real causes of so many of them instead of saying, oh, well, now where does that fit in the psychiatric diagnostic manual? Do you think that the mental health industry and the mental health system play a social control role in society by diverting attention away from these social problems that you're talking about and and putting the the source of the problem inside people's brains and their biology and their genes? Okay, since this is radio, um, I have to explain that my answer to that would be in all capitals, bold-faced, underline, yes, with numerous exclamation marks after it. <laughs> yes, this is the kind of thing I've been talking about for decades, that it's, um, it's, it's bad enough that um, each individual who gets a psychiatric diagnosis is unlikely to be helped by getting that diagnosis. They may be helped in spite of having that diagnosis, you know, if they get a good therapist or they get some other kind of help. Um, but getting the diagnosis is very unlikely to help the individual and very likely to hurt them, which is why we created this, this psychdiagnosis.net website. Um, but um, what, what goes beyond hurting each individual, what goes beyond that level is the fact that we are using psychiatric diagnosis, yes, for purposes of social control, to mask major social problems. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's just like um, a child who's abused by a parent um, doesn't want to think, oh, my God, my parent's an abuser, because they have to live with them. And it's just too terrifying and upsetting to know that you are living under the control of someone who is abusive. So you try and focus on what's good about them or you you try and behave in a way that changes them. I think in a similar way, it's too devastating to think we live in a society that really doesn't value people very much and really doesn't care very much about people who could use any kind of a hand. And, and so um, rather than acknowledge what a cold society we have. Um, we, we say, we, we pathologize everybody. It's what we're doing with the vets who are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. We're saying, oh, they're upset. And instead of saying, wouldn't you be if you saw your buddy get blown up? Or if you realized you'd killed a child over there? Um, wouldn't you be upset if you, if you were living every day knowing that you could get blown up at any time? Well, um, why are we calling those understandable, very human reactions to war, why are we calling those mental illnesses and saying, go get therapy and take your Prozac? Not to say that some therapists can't help, but why, why are we calling the consequences of war mental illness? It's so we don't have to face as a nation what war does. The, uh, the devil's advocate side of that will be, well, not everybody who goes to Iraq and, and sees their buddy blown up or acts or ends up killing a, a child. Not everyone comes back with symptoms of terror and, and nightmares and depression and paralysis. So obviously something's different about, about the people who, who do end up having trauma symptoms. Oh, I, well, I think so. I think there are differences. There are individual differences in how people deal with trauma. And some people deal with them by, by um, developing what get called symptoms, and other people develop them by shutting down emotionally. Uh, other people cope with them by shutting down emotionally. And, um, and so they, just, they seem to be doing just fine. Um, other people have different philosophies and different values that, that help to shape the way they respond to being at war. Um, but, you know, one of, the, one of the things that happened on the 50th anniversary of D-Day was that, um, that, that vets who had not seen each other since World War II 
50 years later came together in these gatherings and just hadn't talked to their families about the war very much or had just said, oh, it was okay, uh, just when they saw each other, just started weeping because of all the stuff they had held in all these years. I mean, look, most soldiers are still male. Most men are still socialized not to show their feelings, not to be, not to, to tell people when they're upset. Um, and so we have no idea what's getting masked. But I don't know anyone. I've talked to a lot of vets who've come back, and, and not one of them has said, you know, what a swell experience that was. I mean, they've all either said it was hell or they've said, well, you know, we, we helped get a school going again, and the people were really nice. And then if you say to them, and um, did you know anyone who got blown up by an IED? Yes. Then their voice changes. And yes, that was devastating. That was a horrible loss. And then, then they'll talk about that. I'm really interested in this question of mental health as a form of social control. How do we talk about that without sounding like conspiracy theorists? <laughs> well, um, as we said in, in the 60s, um, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean there isn't somebody out to get you. Um, there, there, we, we don't have to believe there's a conspiracy um, to understand that um, as, as a culture, as a society, um, we don't make it a priority to be helpful and supportive to people. Let me, let me say a little bit more about that. I lived in Canada for 19 years. And when I left Canada and came back here and was talking to some women about how a very small number of women had managed to, with, within a matter of a few weeks, to get incorporated in the Canadian Constitution the equivalent of the Equal Rights Amendment, which never has gotten passed here, right? Just equal rights. Just people should be treated equally. It's as simple as that. We can't get it passed in this country. How come they were able to do this in a few weeks in Canada? And, and these women were saying to me, oh, my God, how did that happen? And I said, well, you know, Americans talk a lot about justice and rights, but Canadians talk a lot about fairness and compassion. And um, so it's, it's not like this in every country. Um, and, and then uh, another, another example of this is I was teaching a course last semester at Harvard on mothers, and I showed um, a video that um, was produced by a group called Moms Rising. They're an offshoot of, of MoveOn.org. And um, in this video, they have interviews with American mothers and with mothers in France and England and some other countries. And um, the, to my students, I mean, these are these are Harvard students, some of whom are quite knowledgeable about the world. Um, they were absolutely stunned to hear how much parental leave you get in France or in Canada, in contrast to the United States, um, how much more uh, daycare is supported there. All right, so um, in some countries, they make a purposeful effort to provide support to people, to individuals, and to families. In this country, we simply don't do it. Uh, in Michael Moore's, uh, oh, what, what, was, what was this film? Sicko. Right? Was that his new film? Sicko, yeah, his, about new, the his new film right. about the medical system. Yeah, Sicko. Right, right. So one of the most amazing moments in that, in that whole film, I thought, was when he a interviews um, uh, Anthony Benn, I think was the, the Prime Minister of England, right after World War II, and he says to him, you know, it was right after World War II that Great Britain implemented a, a system of national universal health insurance. And Britain had been decimated by the war, economically and in all sorts of other ways, and yet chose to do this major, sweeping thing. And, and how, how could that happen when there was so much to be done? And I can't say it as eloquently as, as Ben said it, but in the film he, he, in essence, says, because it was so clear that it mattered. And, and I think... One of the things that, that Hillary Rodham Clinton did, although for various reasons her health care plan got messed up, 
um, and much of it not through her fault, I have to say. Uh, but but she and Bill Clinton, I, re- I remember when I was growing up, you were you were a commie pinko um, if you if you believed in in um, universal health care. Uh, because it was socialized medicine, and that that was just like the communists. And what the what both of the Clintons together did was to make it not only respectable, but to make it clear that universal health care is a good thing. We should value it. So they they just changed the whole terms of the of the debate. I think. And but, unfortunately, now it's getting turned around so that um, the model that's being proposed is well, we can have universal health care, but what we're going to do is we're going to make it. Um, mandatory that everyone pay out of pocket to buy an right. insurance policy, right. which is a complete twisting around of the whole the whole point. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Um, but I want to I want to just get back for a minute to your, your question about, well, what if people say that we're conspiracy theorists here? Um, if we if we say we're using psychiatric diagnosis to mask social problems, um, it, you you don't have to have a um, conspiracy on a massive scale. What you have to have to get to where we are in the United States today is you have to have um, a fairly small number of extremely wealthy, extremely powerful people who are prepared to mask what they are doing um, in the name of individual freedom. You know, for example, so, so Bush saying that the, Medi- the Medicare drug plan was, uh, it was all about individual freedom and trying to change the social security system in such a way that people would have be able to make their individual decisions about how to invest their money for their old age and so on. Um, so if you've got, if you if you can use the right catchphrases, um, then, uh, then that's how you end up without a massive conspiracy, um, having a society that doesn't look at the real causes of people's pain. And in this country, it's not just um, some of the people who have been at the top levels in the federal government. It's also been the people who have been in charge of the psychiatric diagnostic manual, the, the, the DSM. Um, because I, you know, I, I have good friends who are psychiatrists, um, and they're really good people. And some of them do a lot of good work in the ways that we're talking about, the good ways that we're talking about. Um, but, you know, most of them just don't care and are not involved in the whole process of putting together the DSM. And so having been on two committees that wrote the current edition of the, the psychiatric manual uh, until I resigned in, in horror uh, about what they do, but having been on the inside of that and seeing how that process works, if you look at the DSM, they list probably over a thousand people that they say have been involved in putting this edition of the DSM together. Well, if I hadn't asked to make sure they omit my name from that list, I would have been on that list. They wouldn't tell me when the meetings were. They wouldn't give me uh, information in time for me to respond when they said they wanted responses. I mean, they pick and choose whom they really want to hear from and whom they listen to. And what I learned was that the decisions about what goes in the DSM are really ultimately made by about, oh, fewer than a dozen people. And they're mostly white male American psychiatrists. Um, so some people who fit those categories are really fine. But um, this, is a, this is a group with very uniform, homogeneous views. And they end up being the world's most powerful psychiatrists because they write the DSM, and then so many people follow what comes out of that. I so want to ask, I, I want mm-hmm. to ask you. I want to ask you about a trend that we're seeing now, which is called cultural competency, and uh, mm-hmm. the idea that well, there are all these people of color, there are blacks and Latinos who are not getting access to services, and this is a, a real injustice. And so we have to have cultural competency so those people too can get help and care for their mental health needs, and and. How does that fit Ooh. into the what we've been talking about and the racism that really is part of the bias that you're saying that goes into this vacuum that's created when you don't have real science? Yeah, well, <laughs> okay, that's another huge question. Um, first of all, I think it's important to say that at some point, um, the people who create the DSM um, were, were really um, quite rightly criticized for um, not thinking about um, cultural differences, so that 
somebody would come in and say, oh, you know, I was I was having this image of snakes crawling all over me. And they'd say, oh, see, so they're having hallucinations and delusions, and so they're clearly schizophrenic and get them on antipsychotic medication. And so they, <laughs> the DSM people have dealt with that by um, putting a little section in the DSM in which they say, um, well, you should, of course, take these cultural differences into account, and here's some here are some examples of how to do that. Now, it's one thing for them to put that little section in there. It's another thing for all psychiatry and psychology and social work training programs to really go into depth about cultural differences so that people are not psychiatrically diagnosed when when it's not, uh, you know, when they when they really shouldn't be. But now the kind of thing that you're describing um Oh dear, it's another it's another major marketing tool. It's a it's a way to get more people into the fold um, to cover more territory. So, if um, uh, the other side is saying, don't don't think that somebody is psychiatrically ill, if actually what you're seeing is a manifest manifestation of a cultural difference. Um, the uh, the other side of it is to say. Uh, we need to get more people into the mental health system um, by saying, and and we understand your culture, and we're going to work with you um, in terms of your culture, um, and and so it's just a way of co-opting them, of getting a bigger market. Now that's not to say that there aren't some therapists who genuinely are good about these cultural differences and who take them into account in responsible ways. Um, but it's 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 like with feminist therapy, you know. And when in the in the during the second wave of the women's movement in the late '60s and early '70s, people started talking about I do feminist therapy, and that is I try to reduce the power differential between therapist and patient. I look at social factors that can be causing the the person's upset, and I don't say it's all in your mind and that sort of thing. But then, I mean, that was great. But then a lot of people started calling themselves feminist therapist because it was a good way to get women to come to see you and not, by no means were all of those people feminist therapists do people of color tend to get worse psychiatric diagnoses and treated differently by the system yeah. absolutely yes i mean for example there the, um there was uh <clears throat> there's some research showing that that if a uh, if a black man comes to see a psychiatrist and doesn't make eye contact um, that man is more likely to be diagnosed as psychotic or schizophrenic than a white man who comes in and does not make eye contact. So, yeah, and, and, and in the, the, the reason that we did the Bias in Psychiatric Diagnosis book, I should say, is that um, since every conceivable kind of bias um, affects psychiatric diagnosis, because um, if you look at if you look at every psychiatric diagnosis, you know, there's a list of symptoms. And many of them say the person has marked anxiety or excessive, uh, uh, you know, fear or fearfulness or whatever. Now, who decides if it's marked? Who decides if it's excessive? And who decides if it's below normal and that sort of thing? Um, so there, there's all this scope for bias to enter in. And, and in the Bias and Psychiatric Diagnosis book, we have chapters on a, a huge array of kinds of bias in, in diagnosis, and racism is certainly one of those. Um, there's, um, there is some information in the book by Dr. Wesley Prophet, who's an African-American psychologist and attorney. Um, he talks about the following phenomenon, and, and it just uh, it just blew my mind when I heard this. One of the proposals for the next edition of the DSM is to include, as a diagnosis, racism. Turning it into a disorder that's located Turning inside it, right. of individual brains rather than looking at it as a social problem. That's right, as a social evil. Yeah, that's right. So somebody, what's going to happen to hate speech legislation? If you put that in there, oh, the fellow who emitted the hate speech uh, just has this psychiatric problem. Um, I, I was absolutely horrified, and and the the um, the poor quality of thinking 
that goes into putting the DSM together is reflected in the fact that they said, well, we've, we've appointed this committee to advise us about whether we should put racism in the DSM. But see, we think it's, it could be a really good idea because it shows that racism is bad. Now, first of all, as you say, that means you're transferring racism from major social evil to individual psychiatric problems. But also, if they're saying if you put something in the DSM, that means it's bad, what does that tell us about the authors of the DSM and their attitudes toward people who get their labels? And yet they're always saying, oh, well, you know, these people who call themselves psychiatric survivors, um, they've got a point that, that often people in the system get treated badly, people in the mental health system. But the reason for that is, is the social stigma attached to mental illness, and what we need to do is to is to work against the social stigma. Well, the people who write the DSM are not the ones who work against social stigma, and when they're talking about oh, let's put this in the DSM because that's a way of showing that it's bad, um, I think that's I think that's a really serious and and worrying reflection mm-hmm. of what their own attitudes are. And they turn around the fight against stigma to making it just well, we want it we want it to be less stigmatizing to take medication and have a label so that more people will be willing to do it. That's um, right. Yeah. That's Paula, we right. don't have a lot of time. We're, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to ask you, what would you say to someone a listener maybe who um, you know, has struggled with intense mood swings or or gone into very extreme emotional states and has gotten uh, say a bipolar diagnosis and is taking medication and feel like it's helpful to them and really sort of become um, very reliant on the the label and also the um, the medication as a way of coping and existing in, in their lives. Well, I'm glad you asked that question because um, usually when I talk about <clears throat> these issues, I take great care to say, and I and I didn't say it today. I take great care to say I would never say that anyone should be deprived of the chance to try any particular thing that might be of help to them as long as two criteria are met, and they almost never are. One is that everything that's known about the potential benefits and dangers or risks of what the person is recommending should be disclosed. But often, What's known about them is just known by the drug companies and they haven't revealed it to the prescribing physician or psychiatrist or, or whatever. Um, and um, so that, but that's one thing, that, that everything that's known about what the professional is re- recommending should be disclosed. And the second criterion that should be met is that the professional has a responsibility to present to the person uh, the whole array of things that have been helpful to some people who are having uh, experiences similar to the patient. And that, that almost never happens. So when people are suffering, um, you know, if they want to take medication and they feel it helps and they really have been fully informed, then, you know, sometimes in, in a crisis situation, um, on, on, um, I think it's important to find out if you can do this on just a temporary basis. Um, sometimes that is helpful to people, but what happens too often is it's like putting a cast on a broken ankle and, and never trying to take it off or, and, and, and saying, oh, and no, you don't need to do physical therapy at the same time. And no, we don't need to make sure that when the cast comes off and, uh, we strengthen your muscles so that you don't fall and break your ankle again. Uh, it's, it's just a kind of, of narrowness, um, that, is, is ultimately too harmful to the patient. And so um, I would never say to somebody, well, if you think this pill is, is helping you, you're imagining it. I would never say that. And I would certainly never say that, that um, if you want to stay on it forever, you, you shouldn't. I think that's terrible. But I think it's, it's really important for people to know that most people I've talked to who've been on a variety of medications have said that when they, if they helped them temporarily, then they either stopped helping them and they didn't realize it because their doctor said, oh, no, that, that, that wouldn't be happening. It, this must be your imagination. Or some, you know, they somehow turn it back on the patient. Um, um, but many of these people have said, 
but it wasn't until I came off my medication, which can take months or years for some people to do it gradually enough that they don't have rebound effects. Um, but, but it wasn't until they got off the medication that they started really dealing with and, and being able to feel and see the issues clearly that led to the, the traumatic um, situation they ended up in. Um, and so I think it's important to keep that in mind. Don't ever think that what you're doing is the only way. And just I encourage people to be open to looking at other options and, and getting informed about them. Now, the government and professional organizations should be educating people about this, but they're not, and I've tried to get them to, and they pretty much won't. Paula, thank you so much for joining us today on Madness Radio. Thank you for having me. It was great. You've been listening to an interview with Paula Kaplan. Paula is a clinical and research psychologist um, who is a lecturer at Harvard University in the Women, Gender, and Sexuality program. She's a fellow at the Du Bois Institute at Harvard, and she's the author of They Say You're Crazy and an editor of Bias in Psychiatric Diagnosis. You can find out more information about her work and get in touch with Paula at her website, psychdiagnosis.net. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio broadcasts every Tuesday, 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Pacifica Affiliates, WXOJLPFM, Northampton, Massachusetts, and KWMD, Kasilof, and Anchorage, Alaska. Produced by peer-run mental health communities, freedom-center.org and theicarusproject.net. Listen to our internet stream, podcasts, and show archives at madnessradio.net. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio, to help us get broadcast on a station near you, or if you just want to share what's in your head, contact radio at madnessradio.net. 